questions. Thank you. I want to thank the uh, organizers, in particular Jörn, for the invitation. Pleasure to, to speak today. So, like many of you, are, we're very interested in the lab understanding what is the function of chromatin and DNA modification in gene regulation, and basically, particularly, we're interested in what's the flow of information, who's telling whom what to do, and in essence, how much of this, this kind of structures that, that uh, uh, we know are, are very complex, contain many components, how much of this depending on DNA sequence in the first place, what's the interplay between transcription factors and these, the, and these patterns, um, this clearly our key interest, and like many, we're using comprehensive location analysis as one first entry into this to learn are there patterns for proteins for modifications that we can relate to genomic annotation, that we can relate to sequence and function, and can we use that information to ask who's, uh, who's binding at the same sites and generate some model that how this would uh, probably work and test them. We, we use stem cell, mouse stem cell differentiation as a system that allows us to apply mouse genetics or tools of mouse genetics and at the same time do in vitro differentiation, change of transcriptome, change of cell identity uh, to learn something about how these patterns change and, and knowing something about how they have been in, in, uh, in stem cells can we predict something what's going to happen in doing differentiation. Now, one thing that uh, more recently we've been uh, 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 investing quite a bit in is, of course, one question is, and what we've been learning in these systems that we think that, not surprisingly, that a lot of the chromatin features that we they identify are ultimately depending on the underlying DNA sequence. Uh, and the question is then, how can we really understand the regulation of how much is depending on DNA sequence? Of course, one key aspect then is to say, let's change DNA sequence and let's ask what is the response of the system? How is methylation changing, chromatin changing in response to changing a sequence? Now, we need to do this on the chromosome ideally in the same chromosome of position to account for position effects. So we're using recombinase-based approaches, and we're going to discuss mainly on, on one project with these approaches, to ask the question, if I put the DNA sequence in the genome, A, does the cell know how to methylate, chromatinize that sequence? If it does, then I know that all this information is encoded in the sequence, and I can ask, if I now mutate that sequence, can I learn, can I understand what are the rules that govern this process, and ultimately, does it help me to understand what's going on? And then uh, one other aspect I think that's important, of course, from, uh, from the aspect of the regulation in trans is, of course, how do proteins that are constituents of chromatin, how do they know where to go? Obviously, as you know, these proteins have multiple domains, or many of them, and these domains can guide them to different aspects in the question, which domain is doing what? How can we learn this? And we've been using uh, uh, a biotentechnic approach to learn a bit about protein families and learn a bit what their guidance cues are. So, um, in DNA methylation, a few years ago, we were uh, following Joe Eckers and, and Bing Ren's uh, footsteps. We basically did methylomes in, in the mouse by sulfide sequencing. And when here you're looking at raw data of this, each dot uh, is a cytosine in CG context. Here, the percentage we find this methylated. And uh, uh, what we saw was partly expected, the, the vast majority methylated, then dips of methylation at CG Island, this is a track for islands. Also, we notice these dips in methylation unexpectedly outside of islands, and uh, uh, we're basically using segmentation tools, uh, uh, more recent one that, that uh, um, is a bit more robust or works with different quality of methylomes, to segment the genome in what we call unmethylated regions, so mostly no methylation, fully methylated, and what we termed low methylated regions, which mostly covers these, these dips in methylation. Now, to make a long story short, it turns out that these regions are uh, uh, are basically distal regulatory regions, so the sites that are occupied by transcription factors. It's just one, one evidence for this, comparing it to a DNAs1 data set from John Stem's lab. Um, you see basically wherever you, we see these dips here in methylation, we see a peak in DNAs1, and we have many other evidences that indeed it's uh, uh, distal regulatory regions that are occupied by transcription factors that show reduced methylation. These are CG poor, so that no, not many CGs are affected. We need this high resolution data to actually identify that. But it's very general. It's very setup specific, as Hanens has asked. It's not, there's no, no surprise here. The surprise is that we see very generally reduced methylation coinciding with uh, enhancer activity. You can, for example, segment, this is different human methylomes, and then look at, in these regions, 
and ask, do I find cell, uh, transcription factor binding motifs within cell type specific LMRs? And then you see, for example, that for example, constitutive, something like CTCF expressed and, and binding same sites in all cell types. And then you can look in within your individual cell types. You can see signatures of transcription factors like here, OCT4, SOX2, that are key factors in this. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the stem cells, you see the same for, for, the, for example, these hematopoietic cells. So clearly, what it says is that, that methylation is more informative, at least, than I thought in terms of reflecting ongoing uh, transcription regulation. So what it basically, and we have some other functional data that argue that at least for a, a, for a few selected transcription factors that we looked at, we think actually that the, the transcription factor binding is upstream of this reduced methylation. Uh, we have evidence that I don't have time to talk about, as seen by others as well, that basically at these enhancers there is high methyl of, uh, level of hydroxymethylation, so we think it's, it's at least in part involving an active demethylation process. We cannot generalize yet. There's four, over 1,400 transcription factors in main genomes, of course, it could be that, that some are sensitive, some are upstream of a change in methylation and CPG pool sequences, but this is kind of the standard where we are. It also, of course, argues that, that many methylation changes that people will observe are ultimately encoded by the underlying DNA sequence, because if you affect the transcription factor binding motive that interferes with binding of this factor, you will see also no, no change in methylation. So, which also means, and this is, for example, part of Blueprint, to always do methylomes in cells the way you have the genome, so you're able to link these, these two events. Now, the question, of course, um, we had then based on then, since this seemed to be the key drive of reduced methylation outside of CPG islands, which you know are very different in terms of, of CPG density as well as, as um, methylation state, the question is the same process also working within islands. Are transcription factors contributing to reduced methylation at islands? Now, obviously, we know that islands are full of transcription factor binding sites because there are regulatory regions. So how can we discern a contribution of transcription factor binding sites versus a contribution of being CG dense, and, and for example, occupied by CXC C domain protein? For example, you could imagine that basically within an island that, you have, that simply CG density and, the, and, for example, binding by CG binding proteins would, would be all account for reduced methylation. It's the density of CGs that makes the difference between this and this regions. The question is, do we have on top of this transcription factors? And transcription factors, here we mean uh, uh, proteins binding more complex motifs than CG. How can we separate the two? Because, of course, they're coinciding within islands. So we thought we need to come up with an assay to basically look at very extensive variations of DNA sequence within islands to try to dissect a contribution of CG and transcription factors binding using a recombinase targeting approach that I mentioned in the beginning. So basically, Arno Krebs, a postdoc fellow in the lab, took this on, and he basically said, can we try to target many sequences into the same genomic site? So we could look at large libraries that really can explore the sequence space much more comprehensively than we've done in the past and then learn about what are the rules that govern an unmethylated state within CBG-rich sequences. And that would require them to be able to look into libraries of cells that differ which sequence they have and the ability to look at this, this in parallel. So what Arno came up with is basically a, a, a following strategy, create a sequence pool of interest. This can be custom synthesis, can be experimental enrichment of certain fragments, clone this into a library uh, that contains two inverted log sites. Then we use Cre recombination. It's called the Cre recombination exet cassette exchange, RMCE. And the way this works is by basically we have uh, a target site. Here we targeted the, the, the mouse beta globin locus, where we have a plus minus selectable marker flanked by two inverted log sites. We can now insert this sequence simply by negative selection. We have a negative selectable marker here. We select against that marker. And this works with very high efficiency. 80% of growing cells will have this insertion. Now, the beauty is we have sequence of interest log site chromosome. There's no expression, uh, express gene around. And then we ask, what is the methylation state? And we can do this now for pools of, of sequences and can look in one go into 1,000 unique sequences and ask, what is the methylation state? We can ask the cell 1,000 times, what, how would you methylate? How will you methylate that sequences? And then ask what are the patterns and what makes these patterns. And of course, how do we then measure methylation? We do 
by sulfide sequencing in this pool by doing a PCR with a universal primer that flanks these inserts. So it's all single copy, same genomic site. And then basically our current status is that we have over 3,000 different sequences we've been measured. So a large variety of defined variation in the same genomic site and then can we use this to learn something about how, how the cell decides which sequences to methylate or not methylate. Just to give you an example, here we're looking at two, two inserts and, and uh, comparing the endogenous methylation of this sequence. This is, a, this is a small piece out of a CPG island. And you see this small piece after insertion stays unmethylated. See here the measurement for the ectopic uh, uh, insertion. This is another example of a sequence that, where well, it's different, so the endogenous methylation is, is, redu is, is, is uh, hypomethylated and the insert is hypomethylated. And I don't have time to go through the, of course, there's very different aspects you can ask. We're very excited about the ability to look at many thousand sequences because you can iterate many, many questions that you have in terms of how are transcription factor binding sites, how could certain patterning of CGs, densities, periodicities, could affect the ability of the cell to, to methylate or not methylate this sequence. And we're exploring some of these aspects right now. I think I want to just discuss one, one first project where we, we asked the question, going back to what I mentioned before, can we dissect the contribution of CG versus more complex transcription factor binding motifs? And our first idea to, to, how, to how can we separate the fact that we can we deconvolute this since these motifs and CG both occur in within islands. And for one idea we had, let's take prokaryotic sequences as well, which are CG rich, so CXC domain should be able to bind, but they are not selected for having complex eukaryotic transcription factor motifs. And then we insert a library of uh, uh, prokaryotic sequences and compare this to a library of endogenous mouse fragments and ask, are they the same or are they separating and can we learn something about what's uh, driving this? So here we're looking at, here we're comparing the methylation after insertion of the E. coli versus the mouse fragments. We're looking at five, around 500 uh, fragments each. And what Arnaud did is he basically, he, he, he looked, he grouped these, these inserts based on their CG density. So here are bins with those inserts with the highest CG density. And you see that at this very high CG density, E. coli fragments also stay unmethylated. If we move now into a range where you see actually most of the density within endogenous islands, you see that now the cola and mouse fragments uh, uh, change. Basically, for example, here you see that the, the mouse sequences relative to at, at the same density than the E. coli sequences will, stay, will have much lower methylation, suggesting that at this, at this regime here, C, at CG density alone is sufficient to, to mediate an unmethylated state, but at this, this region, at this level here, uh, CG alone, uh, it cannot explain the, uh, the methylation of these sequences. Keeping in mind that this is actually a density where many, most of the island sequences are. The question, of course, what explains this difference, right? Is it, again, following our observation at CG post sequences, could that be explained by transcription factor binding site? Now, before, before going into this, uh, um, we said, let's first derive a model that's purely taken the E. coli data. Let's, ma let's make a CG-based model of predicting methylation by just taking the E. coli data, all of these uh, fragments that we inserted, and let's fit, here we fitted a sigmoidal curve, but a linear almost does it as well, to predict methylation based on CG density. And if he goes with this, with this prediction to the mouse data, then what we see is that um, indeed he can predict some, some uh, parts of it reasonably well, but a lot of the mouse sequences, a CG only model predicts to be, be methylated, but it's actually unmethylated. And the first indication that indeed this could be driven by transcription factors is the fact that if we ask endogenously which of these fragments have high level of DNS1 hypersensitivity as a proxy for being occupied by transcription factors, you see indeed that these guys here all have very strong signal. Suggesting indeed that the reason why the CG based model here it's not working because it's transcription factors on top of it that, that lead to reduced methylation. Now, how, how can we test this experimentally? So what, what, what Arnaud did basically is, is take a couple of uh, these sequences, these mouse sequences, let's keep their CG pattern identical, but let's change the backbone. This should, just by chance, remove any transcription factor, a complex transcription factor motive, but keep, of course, any signal that's read by six. And indeed, if you do that, I think it's maybe it's not good to see. Gray is the, 
the, the, the mouse sequence and, and, and uh, purple is the uh, uh, e-colorized variation of this. You see in each case, he sees a strong increase of methylation after insertion, indeed arguing that it's, it's non-CG sequences here that explain the ability of this sequences to stay unmethylated after insertion. Another thing is that this gain of methylation is a function of their CG density. So if you're here in this distribution and and we remove these sites, you don't get fully methylated, or mostly you get more in this range. If you're here, you get more methylated, suggesting that it's a function of CG density plus transcription factor binding motif. Now, indeed, now we can even ask, can we take this, 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 this model that we derived from, from this insertion experiment and, and, and go back to the genome and, 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 and show this, is really, this is really holds true? And what we learned are really uh, reflecting something that is happening in the genome. So what, what we've done is basically then ask if we now take this knowledge, go into and try to predict every cytosine in the genome, just taking a 300 base pair windows around it and, and use this to predict their methylation, first using only the CG only model. You see that we predict, um, we're very good at predicting the methylated state, the methylated guys, but here basically you see a lot of deviation from the actual measured methylation that we observe. If we now incorporate into this model uh, DNA's one hypersensitivity, again, as a proxy of transcription factor binding, our uh, uh, predictability goes way up. So we can explain 70% of the variance we can explain by combining a CG density model plus occurrence of TF binding sites. Particularly, we're getting better in, in correctly predicting an unmethylated state. So basically, uh, now if, if this is true, that basically within islands, a large contribution of the methylation state is actually coming from the transcription factor binding site, this would then argue that we should also see differences between cell types. Obviously, many islands are driving housekeeping genes that are on in each cell type, so you, won't, you expect similar uh, occupation there. But I would predict that if you look into, in between, let's say, differentiate these ESLs to neurons, that we would, would observe now uh, changes in methylation also within islands, and that's the case. So here we're just looking at uh, uh, changes between S cells and neurons. You see many cytosines within islands stay unmethylated in the, uh, towards the neurons, but there are some where we see an increase in methylation. The, chan the chances of being uh, highly methylated in, in the neurons is, uh, is higher if you are predicted to be, to be methylated, and if we ask, can, is, can be, this be explained by, by occurrence of binding sites for these transcription factors that are cell type specific? Indeed, that's the case. You see here an enrichment within those sites that gain methylation for potency factors that are absent in the neurons. We see the same the other way around, not as strong, but you still see also it the other way around. So this basically, so we think then that within islands, we have a composite because islands also something that I maybe didn't make clear. Islands are not a uniform stretch of high density. Of course, they are variable in, in their local density. And uh, within, these, within these, you find stretches that are, that where, where their CG density alone is sufficient to explain an unmethylated state. Uh, but many regions do respond to the uh, uh, two transcription factors that are binding to them. And again, this also argues that if we observe differences during, during differentiation at these regions, that they are, in our view, most likely reflect the different activity of transcription factors. Uh, um, act on them. It's also important to keep in mind that if you look, if you ask, if you use the CG density model and ask how many islands do have these stretches that are dense, dense enough to alone uh, create an unmethylated state, it's only half of all islands that actually have that. So it's, this is, we think, is a very general a, a thing that transcription factors are key components in this. Just to summarize this part, so basically I think we have now a nice way to really create a large repertoire of the defined sequence variants at the same chromosomal site. I think this really uh, allows us to ask a lot of questions how sequence regulate or how sequence uh, 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 talks to epigenome, talks to transcription, in a, in, and can do this experiments in a very controlled way. And here we can, can use this to identify sequence contribution to chromatin. Again, I think this, this predicts that methylation islands is a function of density plus transcription factor binding. I think that, that in itself uh, has been suggested before, I should also say. But now we, I think we get getting more a quantitative uh, framework for this. And we think actually that transcription factor binding accounts for most of methylation changes that are observed within islands. And these blocks are really, these blocks that are with CG alone is sufficient. They only present in less than 50% of islands. I should also say that these 
these rules, I don't have time to show this in detail, these rules are off in cancer because what we see in cancer that even, even within these regions there is increased methylation and indeed we can use it to predict, to identify out of uh, 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 transformed samples. So let me in the, in the, in the last uh, three, four minutes just uh, mention, and I'm going to do this shortly because it's just been published, it's published this year, how we, how, how we going about identifying domain contribution to, to binding in chromatin. And this is a study done by another postdoctoral fellow, Tunja Bobek, in the lab. Basically, how can we come up with a system where we can ask different isoforms, mutants of proteins, and map their location and, and using the, the deep knowledge that we have of the epigenome of these cells. So what he did basically has been, been just using a refined way of expressing proteins to do then biotin tagging. And biotin tagging, as you know, has been used by many people, pioneered also by Frank Rosfeld here today, to use as a tag for tagging proteins and enriching them in, for proteomics or for chromatin IP. So Tunja is using these, these insertion sites, a different, a different site, but it doesn't matter, but now he's using them to express a protein of interest with a peptide tag that can be uh, methylate by BLI, I guess, he can use any promoter he wants. It can be low, can be high. So he's not, he doesn't have to have a certain level in order to get insertion. And then he's using the BLI gaze and biotin tagging to pull down and do chip sec. Particularly, of course, this is useful for proteins where antibodies have been not, not so useful. Plus, of course, he can do, you do that during differentiation. He can also go back into these sites with mutants. And of course, then the only difference between these two lines is that particular change he did, so it's likely that if he finds different localization that this is caused by this change and not by different expression levels, etc. This is showing you that in these sites, even though this is just a single copy, that for example, they express very, very uniformly here GFP, this look in the neurons and they're staining for GFP, so this gives very homogeneous expression. And if you compare chip sec for, let's say, in this case, it's uh, SUS12, antibody with a spiral chip, I think we get a uh, uh, very good correlation. And so what he's done now, basically use that to look at, um, at the family of MBD domain proteins, which, um, as you know, are binding methylated DNA in vitro and have been not, have been not, it's, it's been not been easy to, to chip them. And uh, basically ask the question, how do, they, how do they bind to methylated DNA if we look in vivo, since we now have all these detailed methylomes. Um, and particularly then he looked at the entire family as uh, Michael said this morning, MBD3 uh, is the uh, one guy in this family that uh, does not find methylate DNA in vitro uh, in mammalian lineage. Uh, uh, MECP2 is the kind of founding uh, member of this family identified by Adrian Bird uh, many years ago. And so basically using the system, um, uh, and I should also add, there's been a lot of speculation about these proteins do and where they bind have been implicated not only in binding methylated DNA, also in higher order chromatin structure, in splicing, have been also suggested to be activators. So I think it's clearly useful to ask where do these guys actually bind in the gene. As you also know, or we know MECP2 is the causal gene for uh, uh, neurology disorder, Rett syndrome, and of course we could also look then in disease mutants. So what Tunja has been doing then is, is to look at all these. I, one thing I should, I should add is, is uh, if I have time I can quickly go over this. So the, the poster child for the model that these guys bind methylated DNA, recruit uh, chromatin-modifying activities such as HDEX, is this interaction between MBD2 and NERD. So that this would lead to reduced acetylation and thereby to repression. So Tunja did basically look at this entire battery of proteins this way. Uh, um, and basic try, basic to ask which, you know, which of these domains direct them to what sites, particularly asking how do they respond to local methylation density, how do different domains guide them to other places. Don't have time to go through this. And of course he did this through differentiation. And he mapped them also in ES cells that lack DNA methylation, so-called triple knockout cells, to basic to, to ask do we now see spinning sites that are methylation independent. Just, I would just want to go highlight one, I think one interesting result, just kind of illustrates the, the, uh, the use of such system. So here we're looking at a certain genomic region. This is just the methylation density. So this region here has uh, dense methylation at, at uh, uh, CGH sequences. If you map MBD2 with a system, you see binding here, but you also see binding at this region where we don't really have much uh, methylated cytosines to begin with. 
if you map MBD2 in triple knockout cells, you lose this binding because there's no methylation anymore, but you still keep this binding, suggesting that this, this is methylation dependent, this is methylation independent. Now, if, now then, then Tunja looked into an MBD2 variance that, that's tested specific MBD2T that lacks the interaction domain with NERD. Indeed, he shows that this, this, this variant, this isoform does not interact with NERD anymore. If you map this guy, in, in wild type cells, you see methylation dependent binding, you don't see this, this binding, suggesting that this binding here is NERD dependent, requires at least this interaction domain. Indeed, um, indeed, if we look at uh, uh, binding of other NERD members, such as MBD3 or MI2, we see indeed this guy binds here. These are NERD binding sites. They don't coincide with the methylation. So basically, what it, what it means to us is that, that uh, this, kind of I this kind of interaction here between MBD2 NERD, biochemically it does happen. We can see this well, but we don't think it happens at methylated DNA because we think these, these binding sites here are methylation independent. Um, this also, we can also use this to ask questions like, is MBD3 binding to hydroxymethylcytosine? And since we see, do see very similar binding of this protein in TKO versus wild type cells, we don't see any evidence that hydroxymethylcytosine is guiding uh, this molecule where to bind in the chromosome. Just to summarize, basically, I think this iterative targeting can really allow us to explore quite a space of chromatin proteins and to learn about the rules that, that guide them. Uh, binding of these MBD protein scales with local methylation density. These methyl interactions are necessary for many, but not all binding events. And particularly, I think this, this, this co-localization, MBD2 NERD argues that we should revisit this, this general model of repression via recruitment of NERD by this MAD proteins. So our current thinking, what, how is this, 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 this going on? Clearly, I think our main uh, we, transcription factor binding seems to be causing reduced methylation by ways that we clearly don't understand yet. <coughs> What's happening at islands is still means that it, the also transcription factors play a role. How this repression works is still, I think, is for me, is still less clear. We need to really uh, uh, put more focus on understanding how dense methylation leads to repression if Low, low density methylation doesn't seem to appear to bother many transcription factors. So with that, let me uh, quickly acknowledge, I mentioned um, uh, Tunja Bobek did the, the biotin uh, tagging approach, uh, and uh, Arno did the, the, the targeting approach, working closely together with uh, colleagues from computation biology at FMI, particularly Lucas has been uh, very instrumental for this analysis. With that, thank you very much for your attention. Happy to take questions. In the cases where you have transcription factor dependent and independent uh, uh, methylation uh, at these sites, do you have any information about the presence or absence of TET at, that co-localized co to the same site? So we do see we do see strong TET binding at these enhancers. And which ones do you, I mean the prediction would be that at the transcription factor dependent you see TET2 yeah. and then you see at the independent you would see TET1 or TET3 depending what cell type. Is, is that what you see? No, we have not. We've looked at the TET1, TET2 data and there we don't see really much of a difference. So I, we have not really explored this. We see this hydroxy there and also for me it's unclear. The key question that we're addressing this now is is this really, how much is this contributing? Is this just a tiny bit and we see it? Or is this really the main driver of this? And this is something we, we've been uh, exploring, it, but I don't really have any, any idea. It's something, it's clearly something there. How much it is, I cannot say. Um, I don't know if it's me or not. I was reminded um, from your talk of early experiments when we used to transfect in plasmid DNA into ES cells and the plasmid backbone always got methylated. Yeah more quickly. But if you grew it up in a dam minus versus a dam positive host, it actually changed its methylation propensity. So it appeared that the adenis, so the um, methylation of the adenines was promoting yes. CPG methylation. Yes. So in your experiment, do you know whether you grew it up, whether you were co um, cognizant of the we, fact about yeah. adenine methylation? I think we compared it once, but keep in mind these are very short stretches, right? There's like 300 base pair stretches that we're inserting we don't insert the backbone or larger regions. 
So we, I mean, and of course, the key, the key point, if what we learn at these sites, we cannot translate back into the genome, then it could all be just, you know, a local game. It's happening, it's real, but it's not telling us something. So the key litmus test is then to go back in the genome and see what we learned. Does this explain what we observed there? Mm. I think that's the key. And I think the, the bacterial DNA question, there's always this notion that the, the cell might recognize being bacterial. Uh, for me, my view, I, I, I would suggest is the absence of binding motifs other than CG that's seen here. But obviously, uh, at least in that system, that's what would be my interpretation. Clearly, you've got a good system that you can read really back also and done test that. Some of them are also, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm. Of course, we could also ask this question. We've done this in the past with pre-methylated sequences, right? And there's something we're trying now to ask, what does it take to stay methylated in these sites? You can also flip this around, this question. Right? Mm. Okay. Okay, thanks. We need to move on to our next speaker, the last one in this session, but there's no break before.